we're going to keep the conversation going today, talking about some of the research that's going on in my lab. As uh, Stephanie said at the beginning of all this, um, I'm a soil animal ecologist here at Cornell, and I've got grad students, postdocs, and technicians that all are asking questions around basic and very applied um, soil animal ecology, trying to figure out how we better manage below ground pests and sort of optimize uh, the good guys in soil food webs. So a lot of our work focuses on that. Um, I do have an extension appointment here at Cornell as well, and it's, it's uh, mostly tied to working with the turf grass industry. And the reason for that is that a lot of the animals that we manage below ground um, are pests and turf grasses. And a lot of the turf pests out there are, are soil insects. So that's kind of where that comes from. But a lot of what we do carries over into ag systems um, pretty straight, you know, pretty straightforward way. So we're going to kind of bridge that line between residential areas, gardens, raised beds, lawns, and um, agricultural, commercial agricultural soils today as we talk about this stuff. So you are going to see some examples coming out of uh, grass systems, but it's all applicable. So uh, to walk you through the topics that we'll cover today, there's basically four topics I want to get through, and I'm hoping I can get through all of them. Um, the first question we'll touch on is how invertebrates modify soil microbial communities and the processes that those microbes drive. So one thing we focus on a lot in my lab is that sort of interface between microbes and invertebrates and, and how, they, how that influences soil processes. So we'll focus there quite a bit and talk about some work from one of my recent graduate students. Um, and then because we work in a lot of different applied systems where management practices um, are pretty heavy, we'll talk about the impact that a lot of those management practices can have on soil animals. And I've heard talk so far of tillage, um, cover cropping practices, even pesticides, and we'll focus here on some of our work on pesticides and how they impact um, soil food webs. And the third topic is going to focus, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about root feeding insects. And I know there's been some questions about scarabs and things like that. So we'll talk about root herbivorous insects and not so much their effects on plant health, but uh, more what their role is. And when we think about the soil food web or the brown food web, do root feeding insects fit into that? And if so, how? So it's kind of a unique example experiment we've done uh, just to kind of get the creative juices rolling. And then lastly, uh, I think there's a lot of interest in this. We'll talk about invasive earthworms and we're particularly going to talk about jumping worms. So there's a lot of questions people have about it, how to manage them or what management we can do at all. So I titled this too much of a good thing, question <laughs> mark. Uh, we'll get into the, the nitty gritty of that if we have enough time. So, okay. So I, I always like to start with kind of a schematic of uh, the role that soil fauna play in organic matter cycling or carbon cycling. So this is a, a pretty straightforward process that a lot of us, I think, are generally familiar with. You know, plants, it's mostly their below ground inputs, but they're always inputting organic matter to soil. They can be broken up roots. It can be exudates, little things that they leak out. Some people think that they release these molecules to communicate with microbes in the soil. Um, but regardless of whether it's particulate or a liquid material, roots are always putting organic matter into soils. So these materials don't just automatically become soil organic matter. They have to, they go through a number of different processes. Sometimes they do get bound as a, a chunk of root material into a soil aggregate. Um, or stuck on the surface of a soil aggregate. But um, we typically think of this process as having to be routed through some kind of a biological filter. And the biggest part of that filter are soil microbes. So the bacteria and the fungi that Jennifer talked about earlier today really are the main drivers of that engine. So, um, but we, we know that microbes aren't the only player here. And the reason we're all here today is to talk about invertebrates and the roles that they play in this. So, the ways we've considered invertebrates and their role in this process has changed a lot over time. So originally we thought about them the same way you would shredders in a stream. You know, we think of them as things that chomp up and fragment organic matter. All of these chunks of dead root material that are coming to the soil being fragmented and broken up, sometimes passing through the gut of the invertebrate, sometimes not. And it is a very real process and role that these organisms play in soils. Um, the other role that we attribute to them along with this is the redistribution of this stuff. We call it translocation. So that's moving all that material from near the soil surface down into the soil profile and generally mixing it. And speaking of mixing, the last uh, role that we often attribute, especially to the larger invertebrates in soils um, that were reviewed earlier today is engineering of that soil. So increasing pore space, habitable pore space for animals and roots, 
um, increasing water infiltration and generally improving the overall resilience and physical structure of that soil. So those are all very real processes that these invertebrates are driving in soils, but more and more we're now thinking of them in a slightly different way and that's in through their role as governors of microbial activity. So a lot of these bullets that I mentioned up here, let me see if I can get a, a pointer going here. Um, a lot of these that we talked about up here really are not just direct interactions with the plant material, but also ways that they affect how microbes interact with these materials. Um, but there's a lot of ways we can think about their direct governance of microbial activity as well. So the first is through direct grazing on fungi and bacteria. And there's a really good reason for this. A lot of the organic matter in soil is not that tasty or nutritional, um, nutritious from the invertebrates point of view. So why not let the microbes that can create all these wild digestive enzymes break that material down for you and then consume the microbes later? So it's a really nice shortcut. You think of like a fungus gardening ant. Um, it's, it's a really good example of something that sort of exploits the ability of microbes to do all that heavy breakdown of material. So directly grazing on fungi and bacteria is something that a lot of soil invertebrates do. And then the next one is microbial dispersal. So just kind of like they move organic matter through soil, they can also move microbes through the soil. They can either do this in their gut. A lot of spores and cells pass through the gut undestroyed and come out totally viable. And then a bunch of them also stick to the cuticle of the invertebrate too. So sort of passively dispersing microbes around the environment is very common. Uh, thing that they do. So in that way, they can be governors of the location and activity and composition of the soil microbial community. Uh, one other group I want to throw in here is I just keep reminding you all about these, these herbivores that are in these soils, because I do think that they fit in here. It's kind of a clunky fit, but they do play a pretty important role in shaping these organic matter inputs to soil. And we'll talk about an experiment that, that tested this in a bit. Um, but there's been work showing that they can change below ground biomass and primary productivity in soils by five to 30% their presence. And if you think about that, you know, you're taking a, a living root zone, severing it off through feeding and either through introduction of their feces or just the shed dead material alone, that's a pretty big and drastic and fast change in the organic matter input to that soil. So going from living to a senesced or dead pool of organic matter, just based on one feeding event. So a big change in how organic matter enters the soil. So I'm hoping that I'm painting a somewhat clear picture of what is not as simple as is often described uh, in terms of how organic matter gets formed in soils. So this material that's coming out of the root zone, you know, sometimes it does route directly through microbial communities, but there's so many other interactions with biota here, decomposers, herbivores, and their uh, uh, trophic interactions with microbes. That's really important to shaping sort of the fate of this organic matter as it becomes soil carbon or soil organic matter bound in the soil matrix. And sort of the nuts and bolts of these relationships is what my lab focuses on in our experiments. So the first uh, set of nuts and bolts I wanna talk about is, is looking at macro detritivores or macro invertebrates. So uh, we'll talk about who's who in this particular system in a bit, but thinking of larger sized organisms that contribute to fragmenting and moving organic matter, um, we were, we've been really interested in understanding how do they shape the microbial community in soils and the processes that those microbes drive. And this is a question that was tackled by my recent grad student, Natalie Bray, who now works for the EPA doing uh, pesticide testing. So this is Natalie with her trophy soil core. It's kind of a, what soil ecologists look like in the field. And uh, we'll talk about this experiment just in a bit here. So uh, Natalie took an approach, we call this a mesocosm experiment, and she used what we call an exclusion-based mesocosm. So if you see here, there's kind of a mesh cylinder buried in the soil. This is a side profile of the soil where this experiment happened. And the idea here is that we use mesh to, of different sizes to determine who can and can't enter a particular area of soil. And Natalie devised a way to create these mesocosms and install them right in the living root zone of a crop. Here it's a it's uh, tall grasses. So basically we were able to put this into the root zone. So it was interacting with the live rhizosphere. Um, so let's look at a little more detail of how she did this. So you can see that there are these cylinders that contain the soil. Um, these first started by collecting soil monoliths from the ground. So these are about uh, eight inches deep and about five inches in diameter taken out, 
of the ground, uh, we have to first remove all of the invertebrates from those soils. So we have a, a heating and freezing process we use in my program to do that. It changes a lot about the soil, but it'll kill all the animals. It'll kill their cocoons and pupae. Um, it can change the microbial community a little bit, although the microbial community is still quite vibrant after we wake these soils back up. So that heating and freezing cycling to get all the fauna out of the soil initially, the soils are then re-wetted or moistened to the field moisture content out here. You can see some of this moisture is as snow here, but <laughs> that's just the nature of uh, doing work in New York. Um, so these soils are re-wetted, and then they're placed into these different mesh size cylinders. So here we have one treatment, which was using five millimeter hardware mesh. And this is meant to, so it's now fauna free soil and uh, it's re-moistened and everything. So it's meant to allow anything really other than soil, what you would call, I guess, megafauna like uh, woodchucks to colonize this soil. So we can ask about their importance in soil processes. On the other end of that spectrum though, Natalie used this one millimeter mesh, which excluded all of those larger invertebrates like earthworms, that was the hope anyway, but still permitted things like roots to grow into it and other smaller soil animals to colonize the soil. So that's the way we initiated uh, a manipulation in the fauna densities in these soils. So once they're back in the cylinders, the cylinders are sealed, uh, placed deep in, under the root zone and then the live plant system here, it's uh, from a tall residential lawn, is put back over top of that and allowed to regrow into mesocosm. So Natalie um, buried these in fall of the first year of the experiment and then let them incubate for one to two years in the field. Each At the end of each of those years, destructively harvested mesocosms out of the soil. They're not the easiest things to find, but when you do, there's lots of very cool data you can get from them. So you can see how they look here when we're unearthing them. There's Lots of cool macroinvertebrates coming in and out of the larger ones, and here's some of the small ones here. In all cases, these were loaded with live roots as well, which is what we were trying to achieve. So the first thing that Natalie wanted to confirm, though, is that our invertebrate exclusion treatments were what we expected them to be. So I'll just show you how that looked. Um, with this five millimeter large mesh, Natalie found a really vibrant community of microarthropods, or what we're calling here the mesofauna. So these are the mites and columbolins that um, were mentioned earlier today, including a number of insects. So we found root aphids in these, we found thrips in these. So a very diverse and abundant community of mesofauna or microarthropods. But on top of that, in this large mesh treatment, Natalie found a number of other taxa you've seen photos of today, centipedes and millipedes, of course. Uh, we found a couple different herbivorous taxa. We found um, larvae of the click beetle in the family Elateridae as well as scarab larvae. And the scarabs we found here weren't dung beetles, they were uh, root feeding insects, such as Japanese beetle. But the most abundant invertebrate we found in these was earthworms, and they were the European um, species of earthworms, like the lumbricus earthworms. So that was the most abundant macroinvertebrate by far in these soils. So when we compared that to the micro uh, or meso mesh community, this one millimeter mesh, we saw the same communities of microarthropods, so mites, springtails, thrips, root aphids, all the same critters were there, fortunately, but we had none of the macroinvertebrates, so we were lucky that this treatment actually did what we wanted it to do, <laughs> which doesn't always happen in research. So a distinct difference in these, um, and this we were able to confirm this over the course of the full two years, so one of the things that Natalie did here, and that I won't get into too much detail on, but just to kind of introduce the concept to you all, is to use isotopes. So these are stable isotopes um, that we can introduce to a system in various molecules. So we can introduce isotopically enriched carbon through introducing this particularly labeled CO2 uh, that the plants can take up during photosynthesis. And um, we also introduced an isotopically enriched nitrogen through uh, a a nitrogen labeled fertilizer, so which was taken up by the roots. So through a method like this, you can actually get some kind of a tracer integrated into the plant. And then anywhere that plant material goes, you can then trace it into the system. You can trace it into organisms. You can trace it into soil fractions like pools of organic matter. So it's, a, it's think of it as a tracer, a way to kind of map out where carbon and nitrogen are going once it comes from the plant. So that's all I'll say about the methods on it. We'll show one data slide at the end that touches on um, what we found. As far as data goes, the, the, everything that Natalie measured, it's quite a long list and we won't have the time to touch on all of it, but I'll just kind of describe it all to you. 
The first was to, as I mentioned, look at the microbial community composition. So we won't be able to look at the, the community composition data here, but just so you're all aware, she did also, uh, with everything else, look at how bacterial and fungal communities changed um, under these different treatments. And we used microbial sequencing for that. Um, the second thing she looked at was the biomass of the microbial community. So we have some lipid fatty acid analysis techniques we can use to look at different biomass fractions, bacterial versus fungal, and so on and so forth. So I'll show you data on that. She also looked at how microbial activity changed. And for that, we often in my lab use what we call extracellular enzymes. So these are enzymes that microbes produce. They're digestive enzymes, just like we produce, but they produce them outside the body or extracellularly and they release them out into the soil. So they do all their digestion outside of the body and then take up the, the digestion products across the cell membrane. So it's an interesting system because anything can exploit their ability to do that as stuff's being broken down in the soil. They can, they can all consume it. So, um, but we have a method in our lab to look at these enzymes and quantify different types of enzymes. So you'll see data along those lines today. And then lastly, Natalie also looked at sort of physical and chemical responses of the soil itself. And here we'll look at aggregates. So these are the these sort of biologically driven uh, conglomerates of soil that are help with um, resistance to erosion and soil resilience and resistance to disturbance and are often contributed to by things like plant roots, earthworms, and other biota. And this is where we'll look at the isotope data. So this is where that tracer we talked about will, will come back around um, in what I show you all today. So let's look at the microbial biomass response first. Uh, just to orient you to the graphs, because you'll see a few different graphs that look like this. On the x-axis, we've got different groups of fungi. We've got saprotropic or decomposer fungi, and then we've got mycorrhizal fungi. And you can see within that, there's year one and year two, because if you remember, Natalie had harvests at two different time points. So interestingly, for both of these groups of fungi, Natalie found that the presence of macroinvertebrates, primarily earthworms, stimulated the biomass of these fungal groups. So you can see that happened in year one for the decomposer fungi. And this is all species of decomposer fungi lumped in here. Um, and she saw that happen in year two for mycorrhizal fungi. And as we got, most of you probably know, mycorrhizae are really important in stress tolerance for plants and also help plant roots acquire nutrients um, beyond what they could otherwise acquire without them. So really important functional symbionts for plant roots. So interesting, though, that she saw this response in both two different functional types of microbes. Um, if we shift gears and look towards microbial activity, she saw similar patterns. And here we're looking at, again, years one and two, um, but two different enzymes showed these invertebrate responses. And in both cases, the presence of invertebrates stimulated the activity of the microbial community. So she saw this to be the case in year one for an enzyme called phenyl oxidase. And this is an enzyme that's important for the breakdown of things like lignin or really decay resistant material. Think of like woody stems kind of material. Um, and then in year two, she saw this pop up for another enzyme called beta glucosidase. And this one's quite different. It's actually more in charge of breaking down small, call it tastier molecules. Uh, and it's actually one of the late stages in the process of cellulose breakdown in soil. So two very different enzymes, but the same response going up in the presence of soil macroinvertebrates. So not only stimulating their biomass, but also their activity. So lastly, let's look at aggregates. So this graph, same kind of layout, years one and two were lumped here with macroinvertebrates on the left, and or I'm sorry, without macroinvertebrates on the left and with on the right. But there's two types of data on the graph. The first is the overall bar height, and that tells you the overall amount of, of aggregates or macro aggregates in the soil. And you can see that with macroinvertebrates, you end up with more aggregates in the soil, whether it's the mass or the number um, of aggregates. This is a proxy for that. But you can also see there's differences in the color intensity here. And in this graph, that can fit, conveys the overall tag, that enrichment with the, with the isotope tracer. And you can see that in the presence of macroinvertebrates, you have a higher amount of that, that isotopic enrichment in the aggregate of carbon. So um, it's not just saying there's more aggregates, but they're saying there's more of this carbon enrichment within the aggregates, which is very interesting. So um, just to kind of summarize those points, Natalie found that the presence of invertebrates, largely earthworms in these soils, stimulated the size and activity of the microbial community, increased the number and amount of aggregates in those soils, but also promoted 
the transfer and protection of new carbon into aggregates. And when I say new carbon, I mean, this is all carbon that's coming in via photosynthesis and then being released through roots into the soil. So sort of suggesting that it's um, fast tracking that carbon into a protected form in the soil profile, which if you think about using soils for soil carbon sequestration um, and trying to protect organic matter, it's a really important point, so. Okay, so I like to use this framework when we talk about our work in my lab because, you know, we often focus on this left-hand side over here, thinking about management. How do we manage sustainably pests and pathogens to control the damage they cause to plant? We kind of define this as a disservice to the crop, you know, whether it's a residential lawn or a large uh, acreage field corn field. Uh, it's the same kind of process, you know, so this is a, a big focus in my lab. How do we do this effectively? A lot of our stakeholders really want answers to this, like what products work? How do I use them well to control pest A through Z? So, but we like to take a very balanced approach to this in my lab and not only ask, well, how do we achieve this left-hand side or right-hand side of the model, but how do we do that by keeping balance with the other component of the model, which is to look at unintended effects um, on beneficials, whether they're decomposer invertebrates, root symbiotic microbes, uh, biological control organisms like insect pathogens, and all the downstream beneficial services that they provide for crops. So um, a lot of our work in the lab, and this is where we'll shift to that second bullet, focuses on the impact of management practices on these downstream beneficial organisms and on the soil food web. So usually when we have a pesticide trial happening in my program, we have some kind of a companion project looking at uh, downstream effects on, on soil food webs. So um, as I mentioned in the beginning, a lot of this work focuses on pesticide effects, but management takes many, many different forms. There's lots of ways that we manage ag systems, as I'm sure you're all thinking, um, but we're going to focus here on uh, pesticide impact because that's where a lot of my lab's work um, lands. So we ask this type of a question in a lot of different contexts. We've done work in large um, corn, soybean, rotational field cropping settings. And uh, of course, because of my responsibilities in turf grass, we do a lot of this in residential lawns, uh, golf courses, things like that. So a lot of the active ingredients and the ways these products are deployed are quite similar. So what I'll talk about here, despite being coming from the world of, of residential lawns, applies in many other settings too. So this is uh, Natalie Bray again. Uh, as well as my my lab manager Abby Abby Allen. So, so the scenario I want to talk about uh, deals with scarab pests. So someone asked about scarabs before, uh, if they're problematic um, and related to dung beetles. So this is a dung beetle relative, but they're not really work, um, involved in that dung decomposition process. They really feed on live plants, um, and many scarab species do that. This one that's illustrated here is the Japanese beetle. I use it because it really a cosmopolitan pest. It can be a problem not only in residential lawns where I worry about them in turf, but they can be problems on um, foliage of many crops because the adults feed on them, like on grapes. This was actually quite a bad year for this in, in uh, New York State and in the Northeast in general. Um, and they can be crop pests in a lot of different cropping systems. So they have a typical annual life cycle. I think this was kind of discussed a bit earlier. Uh, right now, soils are cooling quite rapidly in New York State. Um, and we're in this stage where the larvae are mature and they're about to sort of drop down below uh, where the frost line is going to be in soil, spend it in an inactive state, not feeding, and then come back up again in spring for a small window before they turn into pupae and then uh, come above ground again as adults. So this is an annual cycle that these species have in our region. So the way they're managed, there's a couple different approaches, but the most common one, and this is where it parallels non uh, all different uh, types of cropping systems is to use a preventative insecticide. So neonicotinoids are often used in this window. They're quite affordable. They're no longer available to the, um, the homeowner or residential market, but they're still available commercially for use. So if you think about the concepts of integrated pest management, one key factor is the ability to use the, the presence and identity and distribution and abundance of a pest to determine if an action is needed, whether it's pesticides or not. Um, but this particular strategy, using them as a preventative approach, you don't really have that luxury or that as a tool. So the products need to be put out typically when the adults are in peak um, abundances. So you're not looking at larvae and saying, where are those larvae? Who are they? You're actually just looking, trying to make an assessment based on the fact that you have 
adults in the system. The other reason for that is because the pesticide needs to be out early enough that it can be taken up by roots and be present in the root tissue uh, by the time these insects' eggs hatch and the insect starts to feed on the larva. So really important to get that timing right and give the product enough time to be taken up by the plants. So um, there's some data suggesting that um, for a number of reasons, there's a lot of overuse of these, this type of a product because you really can't say where the larvae for this type of a pest are going to end up. So a lot of managers tend to use it as a as a risk management strategy, and they'll because they can afford it, will cover an entire site with it, um, not having the ability to assess where the hot spots of the pests are going to be later on. So, um, so yeah, that's it in a nutshell. And it's even though we're illustrating in a turf system here, this is the same kind of approach to using something like a neonicotinoid seed treatment in field crops, corn and soybean, that you want that product out there early enough that it can be taken up and provide sort of a halo of of insecticide. Um, protection as that uh, plant is germinating and establishing uh, for any early season pests. So it's a difficult window to manage pests in. So um, we've been looking at this from an efficacy and control standpoint to control different pests, but how does this, the use of this type of a strategy impact beneficials in the soil food web? So I'm going to show a couple slides on that just to show some of the highlights of some of our work. Um, and the first is looking not at invertebrates, but one of their um, close associates in the soil food web. This is actually mycorrhizal fungi. And here on the x-axis, we're looking at time since application of a product. So think of that preventative application window that I highlighted in red in the previous slide. And think of these as just weeks following that, all the way on out to, to, to 16 weeks. So you can see a couple points here. And here we have two different treatments, control and imidacloprid. This is one of our common neonicotinoid insecticides. And you can see at weeks one and at week eight, the application of the imidacloprid um, to the system led to suppression of the infection of roots by mycorrhizae. So you've got lower infection rates of roots by these really important uh, symbionts that help in stress tolerance and nutrient acquisition. So it's not every week we look at it, but you can see it pop in to the system occasionally, uh, which is important when you're thinking about protecting those, that system from stress and um, optimizing fertility in these soils. Moving from microbes to invertebrates, uh, we've done a bunch of different work here, and this is an example showing how springtails respond to the use of this particular pesticide active ingredient. Um, you can see here, instead of looking at just one application, we looked at different rates because there's different rates producers can use. And um, so we have a low, a mid, and a high rate, and that's compared to a water-only control. And you can see that right off the bat, after one week after application, springtail densities are significantly lower um, under any, regardless of the rate of the product that was used. That pattern persists out through eight weeks. And then you can see around 12, it starts to recover um, in the lowest rate that was applied. It's no different from the controls then, but you can still see some compromised abundances in the mid and high rates. So really interesting work um, and important thinking about, you know, our trying to maintain biodiversity and abundance of, um, of decomposed invertebrates in our soils. Other decisions we make in the system matter for that. And just to give you some examples of how that could matter, um, my current student, Hayden Bach, has been looking at just the control that animals like springtails have on organic matter decomposition. So here's just a slide from some of his data uh, showing decomposition of, of plant litter in the presence of and absence of Columbula. And in this case, we use a really common Columbula from New York that we've collected and maintained in our lab. It's called Isotomia la minor. And uh, you can see in the presence of the, that Columbula, and we had significantly greater decay of the organic matter in, in his study system than without. So there are real impacts to changing the abundances of these organisms in our soils. Okay, so coming back around to this, this sort of a framework I like to use, um, it's pretty clear that, you know, there's lots of different ways that the, through the decisions we make, we can impact um, the organisms that drive beneficial processes in our soils. So just sort of coming back around to that point that you really need to find balance in these, in these programs that we're using, whether it's a farm or, or a lawn. Um, so a lot of people then ask, well, okay, what if I don't care? Can I just stop using insecticides altogether? And I think in many cases, there's a pretty straightforward yes that you can say to that, but I think that the, the answer is not quite as cut and dry um, as we'd like to think. It never is, right? So 
Uh, so I want to talk about a project now that that touches on this. And this was a project that was done by two past postdocs of mine, mostly by Hui Gan, but also a collaborator, Chao Liang. So um, they asked the question, how do root feeding insects or invertebrates affect soil carbon cycling? So as you mentioned, as you saw earlier, we had that one slide where I tried to cram herbivores into uh, the soil brown food web. And we're going to keep pushing that because I think it's pretty relevant and important for anyone interested in soil animal biology to be thinking about. So here's kind of our schematic that we worked with um, and developed from there. If you want to read the paper behind this, uh, here's the citation. And I'm happy to share other citations with anybody who wants to track me down afterwards. So um, this observation came, or this experiment came out of an observation that uh, Huizia had made about just the overall amount of material that root feeding insects produce and turn over in soils. So this graph on the left, this is actually a poop graph. So this is days on the x-axis and on the y is the amount of fecal pellets that accumulate just from on average one, the feeding of one larva, one scarab beetle larva. And I think in this case, it was larvae of a uh, really common New York species, the European chafer. So um, on average, per day, one larva produces one to two milligrams of frass, which doesn't, and we call it frass, it's basically fecal pellets. So uh, it doesn't seem like a whole lot, but when you start to look at the amount of time these organisms are present feeding in the soil uh, and the overall densities that you can have in soil, it adds up to quite a bit of material. Um, so it can be like 150 milligrams per day in a square meter of soil. So we thought, that's. I wonder what impact that has on these microbial processes in soils. So um, Quetia did a short-term incubation. Uh, this is over 30 days, so just about a month, where she um, confined soils and gave them different types of inputs. She either gave them nothing, or she gave them frass, the equivalent amount of frass from that um, root herbivore that I was talking about. And then she also gave them just the same weight, but just of roots that was just mechanic. She cut, cut it off with scissors, basically. It was not fed to Japanese beetle. So we wanted to see, is it the same as just adding root material when you have this, this fecal material entering the soil? And she found that when you do add either of these to the soil, you get an increase in microbial activity. And here, Huizia looked at that in terms of the respiration of the microbial community. This is actually a measurement that if you were to submit soils to the Cornell Soil Health Lab, one of the a la carte measurements you could get is respiration. So it's a really good proxy for microbial activity um, in soil. So um, it's basically their conversion of soil carbon into atmospheric CO2. So she found that both of those, just raw root material or their feces, stimulates the microbial community, increases carbon uh, fluxes from that soil, but the, the frass material or the feces led to a much greater spike in, in carbon being emitted from the soils. So really interesting. So the next question logically was, well, does this have any meaning in the field? Does it actually play out uh, and have impact on soil carbon cycling? So Chow and Huizia did a small field experiment for this where they put some PVC arenas into the ground and created different densities of an important, another important New York scarab beetle, the Japanese beetle. So you've probably all seen Japanese beetle, whether you've got vegetable garden, uh, roses, any kind of thing like that, maybe damage to a lawn near you. <laughs> they, they have a lot of ways that they sneak into our lives. So um, within these arenas, they, they actually added larvae of Japanese beetle. We, we added them based on densities that you would find in the field under high levels of, of infestation, which at the most led to uh, a density of six larvae per arena. And for the experiment, Huizia used third instar, or the most mature larval stage of the Japanese beetle. So they were entered to the soil in October. This is typically when they're feeding really aggressively right before they go down deep to overwinter. They were left in those soils through spring, which ended up being April to May, and then all retrieved back out and all the soil was harvested before those larvae turned into pupae because we wanted to be able to assess the larvae as well. Huizia measured a whole bunch of things, just like Natalie did in her experiment, uh, in this experiment. But just to kind of summarize that uh, here, what we'll look at today, she looked at the carbon and nitrogen content of the soil, sort of the overall stock of carbon that's there. She looked at the biomass of the microbial community again, enzyme activities again, and also looked at microarthropod responses to look, maybe see if this manifested at higher trophic levels at all. So let's look at some data again. So the first is biomass, the microbial biomass of these soils. And uh, basically the graph shows anything in the absence and presence of Japanese beetle, P. japonica, that's its Latin name, abbreviation. So what she found was that in the presence of Japanese beetle, uh, 
you get higher microbial biomass carbon. So a lot more of the carbon in the soil is being retained within the microbial community. Interesting result. Um, looking at activity, she found sort of similar to what we saw before. These are actually similar enzymes to what we looked at with the uh, macroinvertebrate exclusion experiment. Um, but Natalie found, or uh, Huizia found very different responses to Japanese beetle presence depending, that depended on the enzyme you were looking at. So first looking at an enzyme important cellulose breakdown, she found the presence of Japanese beetle stimulated its activity. Whereas when you look at uh, phenyl oxidase, this is that oxidative enzyme we talked about before that breaks down lignin, the presence of Japanese beetle suppressed its activity. So very different directions of response, but significant responses nonetheless. Huizia then, as I mentioned, looked at the responses of microarthropods, and one microarthropod in particular was quite responsive, and it was orobatted mites. So this is an interesting one that tends to not like disturbance quite as much as other, um, other microarthropods do, but she found that in the presence of Japanese beetle, their abundances increased. And then lastly uh, is soil carbon and nitrogen content. And what was quite interesting here is that we found, even though we saw stimulation of microbial biomass carbon, we found that the total amount of carbon and nitrogen in these soils goes down in the presence of Japanese beetle. So really interesting result there, especially again, coming back around to the idea of using uh, managed soils to sequester and store carbon. So um, I'll kind of breeze through this, but Huizia developed this really nice framework for trying, how do we illustrate herbivores into this typical way we look at uh, the soil food web and organic matter cycling. So this is typically the way we look at it, ignoring the fact that root herbivores are, are part of this equation. And then Huizia slowly has been adding um, herbivores to it to mostly stimulate the way we, we ask research questions, but I think also to prompt discussion around their role in these ecosystems. And what she was largely finding was that their presence is stimulating the activity of these communities in such a way that it's causing them to mine carbon from the soil and, and lose a lot of that as CO2. So if you are thinking about um, using your agricultural system as uh, a place to sequester carbon, there might be ways that the way you manage pests can influence that. So it's not just as straightforward as saying, I manage my pests in this world, and then in this world, I manage my carbon. They're, they're much more integrated in a, in a very um, frustrating way, but, <laughs> but, but worth understanding some of these linkages for sure. So I'm hoping that I'm painting a picture of that, you know, really need to find a, a balance here because the services, you know, there, you know, there's departments of entomology and soil and crop science departments, but really this is a, a, a very intertwined system. So thinking about the ways that we manage pests needs to be balanced with our goals for managing soil health. Very, very important to, to think about. Okay, so I know there's a lot of interest in jumping worms. So I am going to shift gears and spend the rest of the time talking today about jumping worms. And I'm hoping that you are all um, have lots of jumping worm questions to unload on, on me here. So, <laughs> um, so jumping worms have a lot of different common names or street names. I think it's because it's, it's so impactful that you tend to see more common names with critters when you have that type of situation. So you hear, Crazy snake worm, green stink worm. There, there's just there's lots of different names that come out for jumping worm, but we'll collectively call them the jumping worms here. I think it's probably the most recognizable. So these are worms that originated. There's a lot of species in here, um, but they generally originated from Korea and Japan. Um, we collectively put them in the group, the phoretomoid earthworms. We have 16 species of them in North America, but here in the Northeast and in New York, we primarily have three. So it's Amenthus agrestis. Amethyst tokiensis and Metifier Hilgendorfi. So those are the three, you know, it was often assumed we just had one that we were attributing problems to here, but uh, more recent work has shown that actually it's, it's combinations of these species uh, inhabiting the areas where we have infestations. So I'm gonna use some really great slides from the University of Wisconsin-Madison Arboretum. They put them together in collaboration with Brad Herrick up there. Uh, that kind of outlines how you distinguish jumping worms from anything else. And we're going to contrast it with uh, Lumbricus rubellus, one of the typical European uh, nightcrawler type earthworms. So first, uh, in length, they do overlap, but you can see that jumping worms can get quite large, up to seven inches in length. So, uh, you know, this is going to depend on seasonality. It doesn't mean everyone you find in the field, you can easily tell apart just based on length, but this is just a frame of reference. Life cycles. Um, 
are, are they don't quite overlap the same way as you would think. So amanthus or the jumping worms do have an annual life cycle, but they overwinter differently. So our European earthworms, they'll overwinter as adults often and as cocoons, but they'll um, you'll often see them as adults. So when you have a thaw, a lot of our European earthworms will come out, even in the dead of winter, you'll see them coming out and being active at night if you go out with a flashlight. Um, but you don't see that with, with amanthus and other jumping worms. They Most of the adults will die at the end of the season, and they actually overwinter just as a what we call a cocoon, which is an egg within a protective leathery casing. And I'll show some photos of that in a bit. So very important differences in life cycle because it affects what you're actually going to see um, in the field when you're observing these things. So the um, pigmentation is a little different among these. You can see that the jumping worms have a bit more of a brown appearance to them. They also have what you would kind of describe as a dorsal, dorsal ventral appearance where the back, quote unquote, back of the earthworm looks a little different than the belly. So it's a little lighter on the belly side. Um, a lot of the European earthworms you'll see have a bit more of a reddish to pink kind of hue to them. So different in color for sure. Um, there's this organ that I, I heard mentioned earlier um, called the clitellum. This is actually what houses all the reproductive gear of an earthworm. Not all earthworms are going to have them. Immature earthworms don't. So you can't totally rely on it. But if you do have a mature earthworm, it's very helpful diagnostically as well. When they occur, though, there's, there's lots of ways you can distinguish, use them to distinguish among different types of earthworms. So the clitellum on amanthus or, and other jumping worms tends to be very uniform. If you look along the side margin of the body, it's just like smooth or down, down the length of the body. It goes uniformly around the whole body like a cuff as well. And you can see it's sort of milky white in appearance and very smooth. Contrast that with the European taxa. Um, as you go along the, the side of the body, you'll see that the clitellum kind of protrudes out a little bit from the side of the body. It also doesn't wrap completely around. It almost is like a horse's saddle that just kind of wraps so like a impartial cuff around the body. Um, and it's also not quite as distinct in color from the rest of the earthworm as, as with jumping worms. Uh, the clitellum you can see on amanthus is a little closer to the head region of the earthworm than it is on the European earthworms. There's actually a number of body segments. You can count that off to confirm it. That's something I doubt many of us on the call are going to be doing, <laughs> unless you got a really great hand lens and just really dig earthworms. So... <clears throat> But you can see it, it's noticeably closer to the head region on the, on the jumping worms. Behavior, a lot of people report, I have a really active worm, it's gotta be a jumping worm. And that's just because many earthworms, if they're right in their temperature zone and are healthy, are very wiggly. But I always say with jumping worms, you'll know it when you see it because it is unlike any other worm you've seen before. They're uh, super active, snake-like. It almost is like you dropped a fish, a fresh fish in the bottom of a canoe, just the way they thrash about they can almost jump right out of your hands. So uh, very, very different in their behavior. Another one, which is will be better once I show a picture of this, but just to describe it here, is the, the feces that they produce. We call them casts. So um, they, they look super different the way it's distributed between European earthworms and the jumping worms. So jumping worms produce what looks like a uniform layer of coffee grounds. It almost looks like somebody dumped their ground basket right on the, on the soil in your in your in your uh, raised beds or land, landscape planters. So it's a really important and, and useful soil signature that jumping worms have been or are inhabiting an area. Other earthworms, European earthworms create casts as well. They tend to be more globular and like isolated clusters of casts though, versus this uniform blanket of castings. And I'll show a picture of that in a bit just to give you more examples. Um, one odd feature, the jumping worms often, when you handle them, they'll separate, their bodies will separate into two segments. It's almost like their tail segment goes flying off. And I think that's probably a strategy for surviving a predation event more than anything, because they can regenerate from that segment. So, but don't be surprised if you find one for the first time, and as you're picking it up, it um, flies off into two parts. So <laughs> just adding to the, the surprise. So um, I was told this video earlier was a bit choppy, but I'll try to play it anyway, if I can actually get it to go. Oops, I might have to take this off of pointer.
So you can see they, I hope it's as clear on your end, but they basically skip around. They get air, basically. It's a good way to put it. Um, they are just about out of control. This one didn't shed its tail. This one is actually a juvenile, so it's a much smaller worm. But um, when they're disturbed, it's like I said, you, you know it when you see it. So very, very noticeable in their behavior. Okay, back to laser pointer. So this is the photo I was mentioning showing the, the casting material with and without cast. So this is a jumping worm invaded soil on the left and a soil without on the right. And you can see noticeable differences. The leaf litter has gone completely almost on the jumping worm side. There's some leaves, but, uh, but you can see that coffee ground appearance. Somebody said, no, no, it looks like uh, browned taco meat. So there's, <laughs> I don't know what your favorite is, but uh, think of it, which, whichever is most convenient, it's something like that. And you'll, you'll know this material when you see it down the road too. And you might think of tacos the next time you see it, but uh, it's a really, it's a huge transformation physically in the soil. This is what all earthworms do, but this is where it gets to be too much of a good thing. Um, we'll talk about why that is in a bit. So before we do that though, I wanna talk about the life cycle. Cause again, this is really important to thinking about how you might and when you might be introducing them to your site and what you might find in the field, depending on time of year. So we're about to go into winter here in New York um, and what's going to survive that winter are the cocoons or the eggs. And this is a picture here of the jumping worm cocoons. So again, it's, it's typically one egg inside of this leathery protective coating. And that protective shell is what allows it to persist all different kinds of conditions like total desiccation, flooding, they can survive down to minus 10 Fahrenheit, um, the adults, though, will die as soon as temperatures get up below about 40. So they really don't do well as adults in our uh, weather conditions, our climate conditions here in, in the Northeast. But the cocoons, they make up for it uh, for sure. So they can persist well. And that's what persists through winter. So once we get to spring and summer and temperatures are 50 and above, that's when cocoons in spring will hatch. Um, and you get this really abrupt appearance of juveniles in the system. It's abrupt, but very easily overlooked because they're very small at this point. You can, this is in centimeters here. So they're just a two to three centimeters in length. Uh, they're often confused with pot worms when you see them here, but you can have you know 30 to 50 individual uh, worms per square foot, which is a lot. Once we get into later into summer, this is when we start to see the adults emerge. So you've been seeing European worms all spring long here, and sometimes on warm winter days even, but the jumping worms don't appear until we get into later in the summer. That's, that's when the time to look for them um, is, so, and they appear. So um, new cocoons, once these are reproductively active, they'll start to reproduce and produce new eggs. And they can be really high densities, 300 per square foot or so is in some extremes. Um, but again, this is e these are even harder to find than the, the juveniles, so it's not like you see them everywhere and they look like little grains of soil, right? So, uh, but they can be very, very abundant, and basically this is, these, ca these cocoons build up go before winter hits, so those cocoons will survive the winter. Some of them will hatch, but those likely here aren't going to be ones that survive winter. It's the ones that persist as a cocoon. That's the life cycle. Uh, there's a lot, been lots of different reports over time. It's feels like a very new problem, jumping worms. But if you look back through these dates, you can see lots of very early introductions and sightings of earth of jumping worms, regardless of species, one of the jumping worms across the country. So a lot here in the Northeast, uh, you can see in New York, there have been six species recorded back as early as the 1940s. So, and like many of our invasive soil pests, they were thought to be introduced in tree root balls, potting soil, um, bilge sediment coming from boats, various, um, pathways like that. Let's talk about how they get around once they're here. We give them lots and lots of ways to do that. So um, they can move around in yard waste, compost and mulches. Uh, compost that are fully heat treated, can um, you can actually control jumping worms that way, um, but they can also recolonize windrows of compost. So they can be moved around in potted plants, and this can be very problematic with uh, plant swaps that are very common in spring, great activity, but also a good way to give your neighbors jumping worms <laughs> if you're not paying attention. And they are, uh, have been in the past deliberately sold as fishing bait as well. So keeping that in mind is important. Um, also within our landscape, you know, we have fragmented forests that have little fingers reaching out into our lawns. Uh, those connect with uh, from forest edges to gardens, raised beds, compost piles, municipal waste sites uh, that are really great sort of hopscotch highways for jumping worms around our landscape. 
Stephanie, can you chime in and tell me how we're doing time-wise? I know on my screen, we're getting a bit close here. So I just want to see. Yeah, we're we're doing fine. Um, we're, I think we originally had just scheduled to end at 12.30, but we have extra time here built in. Okay. So, and we want to hear about the worms. So please keep okay. going. I'll keep going. <laughs> just, just get out the shepherd's hook on me when we need to. So. Yep. All right. You're doing great. Good. So let's talk about some of the impacts that these worms have on our systems. So a lot of this work has been done in forests because primarily this is where the invasion has been most noticeable and most felt ecologically. Uh, they basically remove by consuming the, the forest floor. So this really important layer that's important for spring ephemerals and uh, canopy um, species gets removed. So that buffering environment that that leaf litter creates is gone. So it can expose tree roots, it can make the system more susceptible to invasive species and pathogens, and it also creates this huge, way too fast availability of nutrients, way quicker and faster than the soil food web can use. So plants can't use, it's almost like if you got every bit of, every sandwich you were ever going to eat and dumped it on your kitchen floor at once. That's kind of what happens <laughs> uh, with jumping worm invasion. So they're doing the same thing all soil biota do. They're mineralizing nitrogen, freeing it up for plants, but it's just, it's way too much all at once. Okay, so these same kind of processes though carry over to lots of other settings, small specialty crop settings, landscape nursery environments, and in many cases, turf grasses as well. So we've been doing some research around this arena and asking what are the impacts of jumping worms in residential settings, whether you're using these settings as a gardener um, or to restore um, native plants, um, or just as a lawn. So what do the impacts look like? So we did a quick study with, with jumping worms where we had small shoebox style arenas divided in half. So one half got some kind of a um, organic amendment, hardwood mulch in this case, or compost, um, or nothing as a control. And then on the other side, we created sort of a mini cosm of a, a residential lawn. To them, we either added nothing or we added jumping worms of typical densities you would find in an infested area. So that was the experimental setup. We incubated these in the greenhouse. And then over the course of, um, I think up to four months, we measured a number of different soil and plant-based traits. So I'll just go through some of the high points of what we found for that. This is how they looked. We had these locking green lids because or uh, plastic lids because I did not want to be the person who infested Geneva, New York with jumping worms. So we locked them up. Um, the first is looking at nitrogen cycling activity. And here again, we're looking at an, an extracellular microbial enzyme. Presence of jumping worms, like we saw in many other cases of, of invertebrate um, effects, stimulated the activity of nitrogen cycling enzymes, so speeding up the nitrogen cycling rate. So in many cases, a good thing, but in this case, too much of a good thing. When we looked at the compost and mulch itself, we found that um, some of the compost looked like a food source for the jumping worms. So we didn't see any difference whether they had worms or not on the amount of hardwood mulch over the course of the experiment. But when we looked at compost, the amount of compost left was much, much lower when earthworms, when jumping worms were present in those soils. So basically it looks like they're either stimulating the decay of the compost or they're consuming it themselves. And data show that they actually have the enzymes in their gut to break it down themselves. So um, this effect disappeared when we got up to four months. You can see it almost looks like the compost was breaking down uh, also in the no worms treatment, but it just caught up with the other one. So again, the jumping worms speeding up the process of compost decay, which, you know, this happens all the time, but if you're someone thinking about how frequently do I need to compost my beds, this could be pretty meaningful and, and uh, frustrating from a manager's standpoint. And uh, the sort of final end of this is looking at the accumulation of their fecal material. So I mentioned these castings that they produce that build up, and we saw that build up in all of these soils, regardless of whether they had mulch compost on them or nothing. It, at the end of the experiment, these things were buried in casting material. And we did some back of the envelope calculations and found it was equivalent to about a pound and a half per square foot. So thinking of looking down between your feet and dumping a whole pound of coffee, that is what these things look like. It, it's a tremendous amount of change in the physical and chemical attributes of the soil in a very quick amount of time. So. So I just want to round this off with talking about minimizing the spread of jumping worms. I think this is where most people's questions are going to come in. Um, there are some key things. There are still no good management methods for jumping worms, including no products labeled for any kind of earthworm. And that's because we still struggle to define them as a beneficial and a pest. And it's going to take a while for that to happen. In the meantime, though, there are a number of steps we can take. 
starting off by really learning to tell the signs and symptoms of jumping worms and distinguish them from other earthworms, really important. And I hope some of the resources I'll have at the end can help you do that if you're still wondering. Um, inspecting material, you'll see this on every slide I have. Inspecting mulch, compost, uh, topsoil for these worms. You really can't inspect these soils at present for cocoons because we don't have a good method for that, but looking for signs of the worms themselves and looking for the worms themselves is a great thing to do. That's either by just hand sorting or using something like mustard solution. We have a recipe for that in one of our handouts. You can use, this is not a control method, I have to make sure I mention that, but it's a way that you can monitor the soils. I know Stephanie talked about monitoring. This is a very unique monitoring technique, but it's one you can use to irritate earthworms up to observe them on the surface. Uh, when you do find earthworms, jumping worms, where you find them and you confirm that's what they are, you can get rid of them. You can kill them in something like rub rubbing alcohol or just throw them in the freezer. That's easiest to kill them before you get rid of them. Um, it's not a quick solution, but it's one that you can slowly chip away at the problems and the, the population that's there. And then again, not reintroducing them to your site, only if you're going to use compost, make sure it's compost you can confirm was heat treated in a way to kill pathogens because that same method will kill jumping worms in their cocoons. So making sure you're not bringing new materials in that are gonna reinfest your site. Um, you can look on your active sites for infestation. So here's us doing this on a, a um, landscaping bed at Cornell Botanic Garden. And just by very lightly raking old mulch off of this, we found jumping worms just boiling under the surface. And this is all casting material of jumping worms and us frantically collecting them for an experiment. So <laughs> um, keeping record of what inputs you're bringing in. When did I bring mulch in? What was the source when the jumping worm showed up? That helps you kind of connect the dots for um, how they may have been introduced to your site. If you have small amounts of material you know is contaminated, you can solarize it in garbage bags. If you have small, you know, something you can enclose in a garbage bag, put out on a blacktop uh, surface, you can do that. It's not the most practical method in all cases, and we're still kind of refining what the procedure would look like, but there are things you can do with small materials. Um, reporting observations as well, as I'll talk about on the last slide, is, is a really, really important step at this stage of their invasion. Um, the last slide along these lines is um, not exchanging materials when worms are present. So I mentioned these plant swaps that people like to do. They're really important events. We use them to get out extension material, but we're also finding that it's a way that we're giving each other jumping worms too. So thinking about monitoring the potted material before you do that, or you can. Where possible, cleaning soil and debris from not, not only the plants themselves, I'll talk about that on the next slide, but also on your equipment. You know, If you're gonna go help someone um, put in a new raised bed, but you're taking jumping worm contaminated shovels over to their house. It might be counterproductive. So, so this last point, sticking with bare roots where you can or washing roots if possible. So I don't have a whole lot to say on this slide, but a collaborator of mine with, with Cooperative Extension here at Cornell, Joyce Tomaselli, um, has been trying to tackle this question. And the first step was to see, well, can I aggressively wash plant roots and not damage them? So if that is a method that works for jumping worms, is it gonna have unintended effects on the plants? And she's been testing this with a whole bunch of really common plant horticultural plants that you buy from greenhouse settings and has found that no, it's you can uh, scrub these roots pretty aggressively and still um, get successful planting afterwards. So if in the coming years we find that washing is a good way to also remove their cocoons, uh, there aren't any unintended consequences for the plants, negative ones. And I'll round this off by talking about management reminding everyone there are no legal uh, vermicides out there for earthworms. There have been a number of irritants that have been used in the past. Tea seed extracts like mora meal were used a lot in the golf course industry to flush earthworms off of putting greens. Um, there was a recent product called Early Bird. It was a biofertilizer and people found that hey it actually kills earthworms too. So <laughs> it was being used a bit for that. It is not labeled at all for their control. So and it's been removed for that reason from the market. Um, so we're still in the phase of trying to find solutions for direct control where it's necessary uh, and exploring lots of practices that I've talked about, managing yard waste differently, solarizing soil. Some people are exploring whether or not you can amend soils with sand uh, to make it less suitable for jumping worms. And some are even looking at the use of biological control and vertebrate pathogens for controlling them. Bavaria bassiana is a fungus that's being looked at for that. So my program has a lot of uh, um, different resources available. This is one from a working group that I'm on called J-Worm. We're very easy to find if you search Cornell J-Worm. 
Um, we just put out this homeowner's guide to managing jumping worms. And a lot of what I've talked about today is on here. So um, we're also very easy to track down if you have additional questions and you have a jumping worm infestation at your site. So uh, this last slide, we won't have a, a ton of time to dwell on, but we this will be shared. And I can also share these, these links directly if someone wants to reach out. It's some great links for where to report jumping worm sightings and also for other fact sheets on um, jumping worm information if you're dealing with them. So um, with that, I just want to thank all of you for doing this. And I, again, if we have time for questions, I'd love to stick around and ask some of them. So thank you all very much for uh, having me. Fantastic. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Kyle, for sharing all of the interesting and relevant and applied work that your team is doing there and also the great deeper dive into jumping worms. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I said we can take about 10 minutes for, for questions here with you. Um, there are a few in the Q&A, so I'll, I'll read those, but you can also refer to that. Um, so one person is saying they had an abundance in 2021, not so much in 22, uh, and they're kind of theorizing that it was the drought, the drill dry summer. I'm not sure where this person is, but um, that's a, a comment there. That's a, it's a good observation. We actually saw that um, in 2022 here in New York. I don't know if that person is in New York, but um, that's the same prediction we've made that it had something to do with the, the drought conditions. So um, very, very low reports we've gotten this year. I don't think that's, that means we won't see them again next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're probably just waiting it out in those months, unfortunately. So. And does drought affect jumping worms in a similar like are the the earthworm the other uh, night crawlers affected similarly or differently by drought? Yeah, it, it can also impact their activities. So you, you'll see lower surface activity by other jump other earthworms um, when you have really low soil moisture. They have a lot of strategies for kind of waiting dry periods out. You'll find them balled up together, kind of in knots in the soil. Um, but given the differences in their timing, like when jumping worms are cocoons, they can really wait out those harsh conditions versus something that's an adult worm. So I think it comes down a lot to when the drought is happening, how they might respond differently. Okay. Good question though. Yep. Um, another one here about transmission of jumping worms is about in, in shoes, I guess the same way that seeds can move around in soil that's stuck in our shoes. Um, They've seen a large infestation at a popular local park and are concerned that our shoes are another vector. Yeah, it's they're being treated as one right now. So we know it's not practical to recommend people completely scour the treads of their boots. And, you know, and uh, But it is something that they're, they're including in the language of a way that you could be moving debris around and likely anything in that debris. But in terms of data for how common it is to move in that way, that's very light. We don't actually have good data on it. Um, you know, they tend to be more shallow dwelling than other earthworms. So I think it's more likely that we could be moving their, their, um, their cocoons around that way. But yeah, we need some data on it to know for sure how important it is. But probably a lot of other routes for that, that park that they're talking about where the jumping worms could be coming in, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I think two more here we'll take on worms, earthworms, and then we'll move on to some questions that were from earlier in your presentation. Great. So the last two on worms, um, is anyone doing research and using the worms to bioremediate sewer sludge? Hmm. Interesting. I see that from Dan. Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. People have been shying away from you. Uh, and Dan, I'm assuming you mean worms in general, not jumping worms. Yeah, they, if, it, if you're asking about jumping worms, they'd probably be good because of how active they are. But people are so concerned that we can't control them when we bring, it's like trying to have a wild bronco do something you want. <laughs> they haven't been used for that. Um, but in terms of using worms in general for that, um, I don't know. That's a, it's a really good question. I mean, we were using them pretty effectively in a pretty controlled way for vermicomposting in municipal settings. So I would imagine there's a there's a lot of logic to using them in that setting too. I just don't know. So good question. Yeah. And then. Um... Are jumping worms found in commercial mulch, hmm. and can it be solarized, solarized to avoid that? Yeah, I haven't seen a lot of cases where they're in sort of prepackaged bags of mulch. Um, I think more the the mulch effect is if you have 
large piles of mulch that can be colonized by worms or mulch that's that's degrading. So municipal piles that people can access from a chipper, probably where you could get them. So Joseph Gores at University of Vermont did some work showing that jumping worms have all the enzymes required to break down and eat hardwood mulch, and that it's a pretty suitable habitat for them. So I wouldn't say you would never find them in, um, in hardwood mulch. And I would say if you're gonna, it's more likely in the larger windrows of, of chipper waste that are gonna be sitting there that you can access. Okay. There was an earlier question and I'm, I apologize, I'm not sure if this was from Kelly's presentation or from Kyle's, but it's, if only mature compost is used on a farm, is soil microbial activity inactive? Hmm. A good question. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't have a, a good answer for that. All right. Um, and then a few more here, Kyle, were related to the pesticide section you presented. Yep. So um, one is a, a comment. I'm disappointed that there would be a recommendation for use of neonicotinoid pesticides, given all the drawbacks of that class of pesticides. And I think that was when you had the nice diagram of grapes and Japanese beetles. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question, Laura. And it's not, um, so it actually isn't a recommendation for using neonics. It's it's more of an acknowledgement of how much they're relied upon right now. So our program's trying to deal with the fact that they're they're being used all over the place. So while until we know that they're not going to be used, and I don't think that's going to be based on stakeholder initiative, that's going to be based on someone telling stakeholders they can't use them anymore. <laughs> That's why we're continuing to study their effects. So we know they're they're an important tool in the toolbox right now. So that's why we're still doing work on them. But really great observation. And it's not just a metacloprid. There's lots of different actives within that class that are still heavily relied on. But things are changing a lot. And um, we'll see where that goes. But yeah, until they're not a tool that people are relying on anymore, we're going to keep plugging away there. So I saw a related one in there too, um, Stephanie, about Yep. Will the imidacloprid research be looking at a wider range of soil organisms mm. after your work on springtails? Yeah, so it's interesting. We focused on springtails because they seemed in our data set to be the most responsive to the neonicotinoids. So we did this, a similar project with different active ingredients of, of the neonics in um, field corn. And we found again um, that things like spiders and whatnot didn't respond quite as much as things like columbolins did. So I think columbolins, maybe because they're more insect related and their evolutionary history are probably a little more sensitive to it. Whereas we found other um, responses to different insecticides like pyrethroids when it comes to things like spiders and mites. So it just differed based on what type of active ingredient we were using. So we did look there at other invertebrates, but columbolins just ended up being the most sensitive. So okay. great, great question. Yeah. Um, I guess related to, to sensitivity and things, a new question came in just asking if jumping worms are appropriate to use as a bioindicator. Oh, interesting. Time. Yeah, that's a good question. I have to think about that. I, I think they certainly tell us about a system in its most disturbed state. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think usually when we find them, there's other things going on in the system that other bioindicators might be useful uh, before that point. So, so yeah, it's... They're definitely telling about the system, but we might want a bit more uh, sensitive indicator before that stage. Really good question though. 